All right, let's play our first Kahoot. Let's play Family Feud. Okay. All right, first question. All the following would be considered advantages of exchange-traded funds as opposed to mutual funds, except A, ETFs trade on exchanges. B, ETFs are marginal. C, ETFs are commissionable. D, ETFs are priced continuously throughout the day. So you choose which of the four, red, blue, yellow, or green, that you think is the best, best, the best answer. Okay. Just a couple seconds more. All right, so some spread out answers here, but uh, two ch folks chose uh, the choice C, and this is actually would be considered a disadvantage of of uh, ETFs, right? All the following are advantages except, and the one, of course, the big disadvantage is since they trade like stocks, there's a commission for buying and selling them. Mutual funds, well, they may have a sales charge, but a lot of them are no-load funds that won't charge you any sales charge at all. So that is a drawback to them, but that they think that they trade on exchange, that they can be bought and traded on margin, and the price fluctuates throughout the day. So, you know, you can time your trading here uh, a bit better. Good mutual funds, you don't know the price you're going to get. Uh, you got to get your order in before the 4 p.m. cutoff time, but they don't calculate the price until after 4 p.m. So you're kind of in the dark for a while, and you find out later on the price you bought or sold for. Okay. Again, as always, if part of this, you need any extra details, anything like that, please feel free to ask, okay? All right, let's uh, check our score so far. So who's on the board are Ashley and Karina. All right, and remember, the faster you ask your, answer the question, the more points you score. Let's check our next question. Which of the following is not a characteristic associated with hedge funds? All right, A, they can have highly leveraged portfolios. B, they might speculate in commodities and currencies. C, they can invest in derivative products. D, they are regulated under the Investment Company Act of 19. All right, great. Uh, most folks choose choice D, and that is the best one. Yeah, hedge funds are not considered investment companies as defined under the Investment Company Act of 1940. As such, they're not subject to the same regulations. Mutual funds, right, are not allowed to buy on margin. They can't have leveraged portfolios. They can't speculate with commodities or currencies. Uh, the only derivatives they can use if they're used for protection. They can sell covered calls, or they can buy puts on, on uh, investments they already have but they can't speculate with them. They certainly can't write uncovered calls. Hedge funds, however, not subject to those rules, so they can do all those things. So we do consider hedge funds to be aggressive investments for sophisticated investors. All right, let's see how we did here. All right, some people climbing up the board here. We got some more on the points, but actually in a pretty good, solid lead. Let's check our next question. All the following would be advantages of a limited partner in a DPP except a, deductions for business expenses. B, cash distribution of earnings. C, cash distribution of capital gain. Or D, participate in the management. Okay, great. Okay. All right, some difference of opinion again. The best choice would be as a limited partner, they cannot participate in the management of the business. They, the limited partners are the silent partners, the money partners, right? They have no role in management or operations, but that's also why they have limited liability. They can't be held liable for more than the amount of their investment. So if somebody sues a partnership, they do not sue the limited partners. They sue the general partner who has liability. If someone, by the way, if a limited partner does take on roles of management, they may in fact lose their limited partner status and do face liability. Okay, let's see who uh, added on here. All right, Colby and Karina moving up the board here. Let's check our next one. In order for a business entity to qualify as a limited partnership, the LP must have A, no general partners and at least one limited partner. B, any number of general partners and no limited partner. 
C, at least one general partner and one limited partner. D, any number of limited partners only. All right, uh, pretty overwhelming choice for choice C, and that is the best answer. Right, uh, limited partners have to have one general partner, at least one general partner, and at least one limited partner. Probably more than one, but okay, but it has to have that. That has to be the structure. All right, Ashley's still in a good lead here with Karina moving up. Oh, Jen A's on the board. Let's check our next one. Investors in hedge funds should know that the funds are a, unregulated, but must abide by the law that investors be accredited. B, highly regulated, including a bill abided by laws that investors be accredited. C, unregulated, but no requirements for investment. D, highly regulated, so there are no laws needed for investors to be accredited. Okay, Jen A's All right, very good also. All right, all right, so hedge funds, remember, are unregulated. Like I said, they don't fall under the rules of the Securities Act of 19, 1940. Uh, however, they are still subject to the anti-fraud provisions of the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act. No one's exempt from committing fraud. Uh, but they are offered as limited partnerships and are structured as, um, as private placements. Since they're structured as private placements, right, investors have to be accredited, right? They have to meet certain financial conditions. All right, hey, Kimberly, taking, I'm gonna take the lead here and just narrowly ahead of Ashley. All right, Colby moves up the board too. Let's go to our next one. A hedge fund portfolio has been characterized as being highly leveraged. This means that A, derivative products such as options are utilized. B, commodities and currencies are included in the portfolio. C, there is substantial borrowing or purchase of margin. D, there is substantial in international markets. There we go. All right. That's right. Being highly leveraged, that means there's a lot of borrowing. Leverage is, well, using other people's money to leverage your investments. And so there'll be a lot of investing on margin. Remember, mutual funds cannot buy on margin, but hedge funds aren't mutual funds. Okay. Now, margin, of course, would increase their rate of return, either good or bad. Okay. It will either increase their rate of return, or, of course, if markets go down, they go down even more substantially. So it does increase the level of risk. All right, Kimberly maintains a lead. Alexis moving up and Alexis streak of three. Nice, let's check our next one. An accredited investor is one who meets A, annual net income criteria only. B, income or net worth criteria with substantial investment experience. C, only requirements to prove the adequacy of investment experience. Or D, net worth criteria only with substantial investment experience. Yes, income or net worth criteria, either one, $200,000 annual income for the last two years, or $300,000 if married filing jointly, or a net worth of $1 million, excluding primary residents, can't use their home equity to see if they meet this million dollar uh, criteria. All right, uh, and also, of course, being accredited would also have to have, and they'd have to te uh, attest as to their investment experience. Alexis is four in a row. Kimberly has a pretty solid lead now. Let's check our next one. All the following are true for 529 plans except A. Contributions to the plan are considered gift for tax purposes. B. Plan donors must be related to the student benefit. C. Any sales can open to 529 plan. Or D. Withdrawals are tax free and federal if used for qualified education. Suzanne, the one that is false, right? All the following are true, except it means we got to find the false answer choice. The donors do not need to be related to the to the beneficiary. That's right. They, they don't, frankly speaking, they don't even have to know each other. <laughs> okay, but of course it, they <laughs> they usually do, of course. But no, they, don't, they do not have to be. 
it is a gift for tax purposes, which means potentially if it's a gift more than $17,000 per person per year, it could be subject to gift tax. Uh, as it says, any adult can open a 529, and withdrawals are tax-free uh, if used for qualified expenses. Yes, Karina? Yes, okay, so gift tax, okay, so gift tax is, uh, well, if someone gives a gift over and above a certain dollar amount, the donor may be responsible for paying a gift tax. Now, the annual gift tax exclusion, for, okay, this is a, like I said, up to a certain amount, that certain amount is $17,000 per person per year. Now, that means per person. So every, like, grandma and grandpa together can give $34,000 to each grandchild and still not be subject to a gift tax. Okay. Every time I say that, I can only think of one thing. Where were my grandparents? Okay, let's check our next one. All right, Kimberly, five in a row and a pretty solid lead. Okay, that's good. Let's try our next one. Which of the following securities are non-exempt from registration with the Securities Act of 1933? A, corporate debt issues by and U.S. government agency issues. B, municipal securities and U.S. government agency issues. C, U.S. government treasury issues and REITs. Or D, real estate investment trusts and corporate equity issues. Right, some difference of opinion. Remember, read carefully. One word makes the difference sometimes. In this case, it's not even a word. Right? It's a prefix that makes the difference. Which of the following securities are non-exempt? Right, which means that they um, they are ex right they are not exempt from registration and therefore have to register. Real estate investment trusts and corporate equities. Right, no exemption for them. Anything government related, for example, and a lot of these were government. Uh, we already know who the government is, so we don't have to worry about registering those securities. Okay, Hannah, five in a row. Ashley moves up. Kimberly's hand maintains a lead. How many? How often may funds be rolled over from one state's five, Section 529 to another's? A, once every 12 months. B, once per semester. C, no more than twice per calendar year. Or D, as often as... Great work, everyone. Once every 12 months is how funds may roll over from one state's 529 to another. Okay, and that's a rolling 12 months, so always keeping up with that. Thank you. Excellent work. That's a little obscure one, so that's a good one. That's great. All right, Kameen and Colby have moved up. Kimberly maintaining a lead. Which of the following securities would most likely have the lowest expense ratio? A, non-qualified variable annuity. B, exchange-traded fund. C, mutual fund. D, qualified Excellent, right. An exchange traded fund would likely have the lowest expense ratio. All these investment companies have expenses. It's an investment company, right? It's a business. All businesses have expenses, but like any business, if you keep the expenses low, you keep the profits higher. And exchange traded funds, well, they're famous for having low costs and fees because they use an indexing strategy, a passive management. The fund manager isn't picking their own investments. They just follow along and track a market index, which keeps the management costs very low. They do very little trade, trading of the investments, so it keeps the transaction costs low. So that's one of the big things about exchange traded funds. Low costs and fees. It's, it's their deal. It's their whole, it's their whole thing. <laughs> right? Combine that with the flexibility of being able to trade them like a stock, you end up with a very popular product. All right. So everyone's staying the same, but adding some points. All the following be associated with hedge funds except. 
A, investing in government debt securities. B, the use of short positions selling securities the portfolio does not own. C, high leverage portfolio borrowing to purchase securities. Or D, commodity speculations. Okay, excellent, excellent work. So yes, hedge funds would not be associated with buying government bonds, right, which are super safe. Now, it doesn't mean they can't, but all the others, well, only hedge funds can, you know, sell stock short, trade on margin, or speculate using commodities. Okay, no other fund can do that. So, okay, process elimination, you're really invest, you know, investing in government debt is not what they're known for. Kimberly's three in a row. Nice work. Okay, and a pretty commanding lead, too. Next question. A prospectus must be delivered to customers following the transaction and all the following except. A, follow on offering of the common stock by a public reporting company. B, ETFs. C, mutual funds. D, unit investment trust. Well, the best one was ETF. Yes. Okay. Because a prospectus has to accompany newly issued securities, right? If it's newly issued, it has to have a prospectus, a legal document that describes the investment, full and fair disclosure of all material facts. But an ETF is not new issued, right? They're secondary market. They're trading on a stock exchange, trading between investors. A follow-on offering is a new issue, right? They're offering new securities for sale to investors. Mutual funds also are always a newly issued security. Every time someone buys into a mutual fund, new shares are created with every purchase, shares that didn't exist before. So it always requires a prospectus. And the UIT also right, are newly created for investors. All right, to exp okay, question is, can I explain a UIT? So it's also a type of investment company. So right, gathers a lot of people's money together, use it to create a big, huge investment portfolio, and everyone who's put their money into it has a piece of this portfolio. But a unit investment trust is, a, okay, it's structured differently. As a trust, money is being held in trust for investors. So it's structured as a trust, it cannot last forever. It has to have a termination date. See, mutual funds, right, they're organized as corporations. They can conceivably last forever. But a UIT has to have a termination date. So it has to have a finite life. Also, one thing that's different about UITs, they're considered to be non-managed, not just passively managed. ETFs are passively managed. Ex unit investment trusts are non-managed other than the initial allocation. So they gather all these people together, they buy a big basket of investments, but other than that, they're not going to touch it. It's just going to be buy and hold until the maturity date of the trust. So because there's little, if anything, in the way of management, there's little, if anything, in the way of management fees. So it's a really low cost way of pooling people's money together and investing for them. That's why a lot of our organizers bond trusts, right? So they'll buy a basket of bonds, and the, the day the last bond matures, that's the day they'll dissolve the trust. Send a check to investors, and investors can, you know, they'll get their prorated share. Investors then have a choice. Take the money and run, or reinvest the proceeds into the next UIT in the series. Because when one trust matures, a new one will be created. <laughs> okay, does that help you out? All right, thanks, Karina. And Kimberly, a streak of four. All right, Colby moves on up. Let's check. I think this is, yeah, the last one. Section 529 plans are considered municipal fund securities. Therefore, they must be sold by A, official statement, B, investment letter, C, prospectus, or D, security memo. Do you see that picture of that dog? That is, I was, is that a dog or a horse? They're sold by official statement. Municipal fund securities. That means these are sold by municipalities. 529 plans are state sponsored. Each state sets up its own 529. So the differences on 529 has gone very somewhat from state to state. So they're, they are exempt from SEC registration and from a prospectus delivery requirement. 
instead of a prospectus, it's an official statement, which does what a prospectus does, <laughs> providing full and fair disclosure of all material facts to potential investors. All right, let's see how we're doing here. Okay, third place bronze medalist, Colby. Second place in silver medalist, it's Alexis. And in first place, gold medal and Olympic champion, Kimberly. All right, <laughs> round of applause for everybody. All right, <laughs> applause and horns and all that. Oh, great stuff. Okay. All right, so I hope you found that useful. Right, let me go ahead and first I'll pause the recording. Okay, so picking up where we left off from Monday. So our next section here is on order types. Always get a lot of questions about order types. And when I work as a rep, I get calls like these two or three times a day, right? People just open their new accounts, they go onto the website, go to set up a trade, and they see all these choices. So they call and say, what's the difference between a market order and a limit order? Well, after answering that question two or three times a day for a few years, I think I got pretty good at it. So let's go ahead and talk about the order types. All right, first off, we gotta say, what's the, about the terms of long and short orders? All right, now remember, this is like industry, industry jargon. And industry jargon, all right, the phrase long, sorry, long means to own. So if someone buys an investment, we say they're long that investment. So if you bought like 200 shares of Nike, go around telling people saying, yeah, I'm long 200 Nike. You sound more impressive that way. <laughs> all right, now, since this is something they own, this is an asset, all right? It is also a bullish position. Remember, bullish means it's someone who thinks it's going to go up. So they think that, so that's why they buy the shares. They hope to appreciate in value. Conceivably, of course, at least in theory, could be unlimited potential gains. There's no limit how high a price of a stock can go. The most they can lose, of course, is the amount of their investment. So worst, that's, that's the worst case scenario, right? It's losing all, you bought a stock and its company goes bankrupt. <laughs> okay, sorry, sometimes that happens. If long means to own, then short means to owe. And therefore, this is a liability. So when someone sells a stock short, they're selling something that they don't have. How can you sell something you don't have? <laughs> By arranging to borrow shares from their broker dealer firm. They borrow shares of stock, maybe they borrow 200 Nike, sell them in the market, they get the money deposited into their accounts, but can't take that money out, can't go spending it because they have a liability. They owe their broker dealer 200 shares of Nike, which they have to replace eventually. The plan is, wait for shares of Nike to fall in price, buy them back later when it's cheaper, use that to replace what they borrowed so they don't owe anything anymore, right? They've covered their short position and they get to keep the difference. All right, so their potential gain is of course limited because you know, the stock goes down, well, it can only go down to zero, okay? But losses are conceivably unlimited because the higher it goes, if it goes up instead of down, they lose money because then they have to replace what they borrowed at higher prices. Yeah, this is a bearish strategy. The phrase bearish means someone who expects it to go down. Are you familiar with the term bullish and bearish, by the way? Uh, and maybe where does those terms come from? Where do they get those metaphors, those animal metaphors? Amy says yes, and Ashley and Alexis. All right, all right, but that's, that's good. <laughs> okay, good. All right, as long as we understand, if it's not clear, of course, please let me know, all right? Okay, now when we're trading in stocks, stocks are bought and sold in a, uh, a standardized unit. That's, that unit is called a round lot, and a round lot is 100 shares. So stocks are bought in 100 share blocks at a time called a round lot. So that's just, that's like eggs are bought and sold by the dozen, right? Okay, stocks are sold by the round lot of 100 shares. An odd lot, however, is an order that's less than 100 shares. I mean, you can just buy one share, but that's called an odd lot trade. There used to be a thing called an odd lot differential. It's like if you wanted to buy a half a dozen eggs, you might have to pay more per egg, right? Well, they don't do that anymore because it's all automated, so they don't have to worry about it. So in order, like it says here, 330 shares is three round lots and one odd lot. Okay, that's just the standard unit of trading. Now, some orders are based on time. Okay, how long do they want their order to be in force? If the order is entered as a day order, well, that means it's only good for the one business day. And if that order is not fulfilled by the end of the day, the order is canceled. And if they'll have to replace their order if they still want it. Uh, but if someone wants to have this as an open standing instruction, right, they would enter that as a good till cancel order, GTC, or good till cancel. That order is an open standing instruction and will remain in effect until either the order is actually fulfilled or the customer cancels the order or some period of time goes by 
and the order expires. Okay, now these, the note here says that some firms will set a limit on them and cancel them. Where I used to work, it was, uh, it was uh, six months. So, uh, I'm sorry, not six months, 60 days, my apologies, 60 days. So if the order was staying open for 60 days, they just automatically cancel it. Now, having said that, there is a requirement, right? That FINRA requires that firms must clear, firms must clear all open orders, right? All open orders, the last trading day of April, and October, right? So that's twice a year, they have to clear out their books of all open orders. Now, here's a way I can remember that. What is the last day of October? Can you tell me? What's the last day of October? Not the 31st, yes, but what's so special about October 31st? Ah, you got Alexis, right. Halloween. <laughs> okay, so that's a that's an easy way for me to remember. They got to clear out their open orders on Halloween and six months later. <laughs> okay. All right. They can also have orders that are at the open or at the close or market open or at the close. So basically, they'll get the order right at the opening trade or at the very last closing trade of the day. Okay. Okay. So uh, by the way, uh, I worked as a rep for like eight and a half years. Never once took an order that was open at the open or at close. All right, now we have orders based on price. And these are mostly, most of your orders are going to be like this, based on price. All right, well, so we have different types of orders that people can place. Now, a market order is the simplest, easiest order. When someone enters a market order, they're going to get and they're willing to accept the market price, whatever that price is, at that particular moment. And it's the moment that their order gets to the stock exchange. Or I can even say at the front of the line at the stock exchange. Okay, so the order will go through at that price. Market orders are the most common order. They are the fastest order. They're nearly instant execution. And they are guaranteed fulfillment. The order will be fulfilled at market price. What's not guaranteed is the price. Because prices fluctuate, sometimes very rapidly. So there is a chance. It's a small one, but it's possible. Whoops. Okay. Are we still connected? <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. That was just the time my Wi-Fi said, oh, I, I have to shut down <laughs> because this would be at the most inconvenient time. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me, uh, okay. You still got the presentation going, right? That's what it looks like on my side. Okay. So the last thing you heard was they're the fast. Okay. Market orders are the fastest order. They are guaranteed, they're, they're, they're guaranteed fulfillment. The order will be fulfilled at market price. What is not guaranteed is the price because prices fluctuate sometimes very rapidly. So there's a chance, and it's a small one, but it's a chance that the price of the stock could move even in the small amount of time it takes to get a price quote, set up an order, send it in, and get, get electronically traded. All right, so, okay. So, now, by the way, sometimes that can work in your favor. Sometimes you get a better price. On the other hand, sometimes it goes against you. You get a worse price, but the idea is you do get it as a market order, right? And I can tell you far, far and away most of the time. If you place a buyer, you get the bid, you get the ask price. If you place a seller, you get the bid price. Now, if somebody doesn't want to trade just at whatever, or they just want to trade at market, what if they want a particular price? They want to, there's a price they want. In that case, they will place a limit order. Think of that they're setting a limit to the most they're willing to pay if they're buying, or the least they're willing to take if they're selling. So when they place a market a limit order, they specify a current price, and their order can only be fulfilled at the price they want or a better price if possible, but nothing worse than that. Okay. And by the way, when I say better or worse, that's always from the investor's point of view. Now, if they place a market order, they'll just enter it says something like buy 100 ABC at market. But if they want to place it at a specific price, they don't want to just at anything, then they place a limit order. Let's say buy 100 ABC at 45. That might be an example. So when they place an order, they specify the specify a price, it's understood that that's a limit price. In a buy order, the limit price is going to be placed at or below the current price. This order says if it comes down to this price, buy it. In a sell order, their limit price is placed at or above the current price. So this says if it goes up to this price, sell it. 
If it gets to their price, they'll sell it, could basically get a better price if possible. But if it doesn't, re if the actual market price does not read the price they want, their limit price, the order is not fulfilled. So limit orders get you the price you want, but then there's no guarantee of execution. Okay, now this one's going to be a little more of a concept, and that's a stop order. All right, when someone enters a stop order, they're setting a uh, they're setting a stop price. Now think of that as being a trigger or activation price. And this says if that stock trades at or through their stop price, then but only then the order gets activated. Otherwise, it does not activate. The technical term is it says here is elected. That's that's the technical term. The order is elected. And if it's ever activated or triggered, then it becomes a market order. And as a market order, will execute at next available price, whatever that is. And I do mean whatever that is. So since it becomes a market order, if it's activated, then the stop order can be fulfilled at the stop price, above it or below it, and maybe even significantly above or below it. That's a possibility. In a sell order, they usually see them as sell orders, the stop price is placed below the current price. This order says it goes down to this price, sell. And if it's a buy order, the stop price is placed above the current price. This says it goes up to this price, buy. Now, a question usually comes up right about now. Why does somebody want to place a buy stop order? Why would they say they want to buy it at a price above the current price? Why do they want to pay more for it? All right. First off, it helps to know. I think it helps to know stop orders used to be called stop loss orders sometimes you still hear that term that's usually why people use them they're trying to limit their losses it's their throwing the towel right it's going the wrong way i want out price maybe somebody bought the stock at 50 and it says okay if it goes to 45 sell it's going the wrong way when someone sells a stock short which we just mentioned right in a short sale they profit if the stock goes down but they lose money if it goes up so in that case, they're trying to limit their losses by saying it goes up to this price, buy it back in, I'm done with this, right? That's the idea. Okay, so if someone places a, a stop order, they might say an order to say, that says sell 100 ABC at 45 stop. So this says it would be above 45 when they enter the order. If it trades at 45 or below, right? If it goes to it or through it, it becomes a market order and sells at market price. Question says, are limit and stop orders only for long sales or can they be for short sales? They absolutely can be for long sales and short sales. Absolutely. They sure can. Okay. Uh, let me see if it talks about this here. Okay. No, all right. Anyway, notice here, I had to say 45 stop. So I had to specifically indicate that this was a stop order because if I didn't indicate it and I just said sell at 45. If I don't say otherwise, it's understood that that's a limit order. This says sell for no less than 45. Uh, yes, Jason. That's right. If it trades at or below 45, to it or through it, then but only then the order is activated and sells at market. Uh, I'm sorry, say again? Well, if it's, okay, if it stays, okay, if it stays above 45, it doesn't trade at or below 45. The order is not activated. Okay. Now, understand this. as If it ever trades at 45, as soon as it hits 45 or below it, the order gets activated or elected. Becomes a market order. Next available price, whatever that is. Now, it's possible that the next available price is above 45. That's possible. But it only happened because the stock did trade at or through their stock price. Okay. Uh, question is, are these traded uh, automatically electronically? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. As soon as the market price hits the limit price? Well, if it hits the limit price, now remember, limit price says I'm willing to pay this much or I'm willing to sell, uh, only willing to sell it for that much. Now, keep in mind, on the stock exchange, right, there's an open order book, right? If someone has an order to buy 100 ABC at 45, they're going to be online with everybody else who's got an order to buy at 45 too, <laughs> Okay. So the people who are ahead of them in line get their orders fulfilled first. So there's the chance, and this happens sometimes, rarely, uh, but it does happen, right? Stock trades at 45, or the price goes to 45, but only stays there for like a moment or two before going back up again. So all the people at the front of the line get their orders fulfilled, and people behind them didn't get their orders fulfilled. 
All right, that, that does sometimes happen. Okay. Now, remember, as a stop order, if it ever hits the stop price, the order is activated, becomes a market order, and executes at next best available price, whatever that price is. Okay, so it's just a trigger price. Now, regulators do not like the term stop loss because it's misleading. It can't actually prevent a loss. It's just a trigger activation price. Uh, let me see if there's mentions here. Okay, so here's some examples here. All right, buy stop order. Customer is short XYZ stock. That means they expect to go down. They lose money if it goes up. So the stock last traded at $49, and so they place an order buy stop at 52. This order says, if this stock, XYZ stock, trades at 52 or above, the order is going to be activated and becomes a market order and buys at next best available price to close out and cover their short position. Right, so they don't owe anything anymore and they'll probably have lost money on that but right they're trying to limit their losses that way will the order execute and fulfill at 52 it might it might not in a sell stop well that's when someone owns the stock they obviously hope it goes up but hey sometimes it doesn't go according to plan so what if the stock falls and xyz is currently 42 dollars and they say if it ever trades or goes down to or below 40 the order gets activated, executes the order, sells at market, whatever that is, and that will sell out their long position. Right, you close them out. Again, probably at a loss, but they're trying to limit their losses. Now, they could also try and do that to lock in gains. What if they actually someone bought the stock at 35, and now it's like 42 and says, okay, well, I'd like, I'd like to lock in some gains here, so if it falls to 40, sell. That's another way to do that. Okay, uh, let me see. Hang on a second. I'm just going to take, okay, it's not here, so I'm going to go back here. Now this stop order, let's say sell at 45, okay. Well, what happens if the stock crashes? What if there's bad news comes out about the company and it drops in half overnight? I've seen that happen. Well, it just went through their stop price, just massively went through it. It becomes a market order to sell and it will sell at the best available price. Well, best of market price is half of what it was yesterday. <laughs> so the trade confirmation come back that says they sold it at 25, not 45, that can happen. So I'll give you a real life example here. Okay, I got a call from a customer once. Okay, <laughs> and she was furious. Oh, she was she was mad enough to chew nails. Her order, she had an open order to sell 100 IBM at one uh, 105 stop. So this order says, if IBM trades at or below 105, execute a market order to sell. All right, well, the thing is, bad news came out about IBM that morning. And when IBM opened for trading, it had gapped down from the previous day's close. It's this quantum leap downward. And the opening trade opened at 100. That was the opening trade, $100 exactly. Well, the trigger price was 105, to it or through it, and just went through it. Becomes a market order to sell. So it just sold at the market price. So the trade confirmation comes back. Sold 100 IBM at 100. She was furious. She expected to sell it at 105. That was her stop price. Try as I might to explain that, all right, is the, is the stop price is a trigger or activation price and just sells it whatever it is. Well, when IBM opened for trading, that was the price, 100. There was nobody around, at least not at market open, who was willing to pay 105 for it. After all, if you want to sell it, someone else got to want to buy it. That was the price there. So sometimes that it can't protect you against a gap like that. Well, she wasn't having any of it. Nothing I said made any difference, but sometimes that's how it goes. If she were not willing to sell for less than 105, then she could have entered a stop limit order. All right, there's not a slide on this, so I want to make sure we cover this. So it's called a stop limit order. In this case, they set two prices. First, they set the stop price, that's the trigger activation price. And then instead of trading out whatever, Someone does they want a specific price, then they enter a limit price. So in this case, if the order hits the stop price, the order activates or is elected and becomes a limit order to say the most they're willing to buy for it, or at least they want to sell for it. So if she were not willing to sell for less than 105, instead, she could have entered an order to sell at 105 stop limit. This says if IBM trades at 105 to it or through it, the order becomes activated, but it's now a limit order to sell for no less than 105. Well, IBM opened at 100. The stop price has just been activated. The order is now a live order to sell at 105. 
Will she sell her stock? Will she sell IBM? No, because it's less than her limit price. She doesn't want to sell for less than 105, but the market price is 100. If IBM comes back to 105, then she'll sell it. If it doesn't come back, what if they just go in 99, 98? Then she'd have this open order sell at 105, but the order is not going to be fulfilled. It's less than her limit price. So that's sometimes the chances you take. Now, she could also have maybe give it a little wiggle room. She can say, all right, if it goes to 105, sell, but don't sell for less than 104. So they could put, she could put it over here, right? Sell at 105, stop, limit 104. 105 is the trigger price. If it's activated, it becomes a limit or sell for no less than 104. And as long as it's 104 or higher, when it's activated, she'll sell it. Less than 104, won't sell it unless it comes back to 104. Okay, that's how they work. Here's another way that people use stop orders. Again, I don't see the slide for this here. So, yeah, no, I don't see a slide. So I'm going to cover this here. Okay, here's how they can do it. Someone might be looking at a stock and they notice that the stock seems to be like bouncing back and forth here. Okay, I'm trying to arrange some, trying to find my drawing tools here. Uh, why can't I find my drawing tools? No. Should have a list of drawing tools here. There's a shape. Oh, yeah. Okay. Shapes. Right. Okay. So someone looks at a stock and they notice that the stock seems to be kind of bouncing around. Okay. And just trading between two prices here. Okay. So it gets to about right between four, uh, 50 and uh, 45. Okay. So it's been a little more like this. Okay. So it's been a little um like um let's see this one yeah okay all right up and down up and down like this okay like so okay so the thing is right you see it gets to about 50 dollars a share but can't seem to get above that it says it meets resistance at 50. then it drops down to about 45 but can't seem to get below that so we say it meets support at 45. now someone could watch this and say well you know what if this ever trades at 51 well, that would suggest that now investors, people, the, the market is willing to pay more for it than they have been recently. So first you've got this market that can't really make up its mind. But now if it trades at 51, it's broken out of resistance. Maybe that now maybe the market has changed its mind. And that could maybe start a new uptrend, right? It could start trading up from there if it ever trade, breaks out and trades at 51. So they don't want to play this whole sideways thing, this you know, choppy thing. They want to ride a trend. So they want to buy ABC stock here, but they only want to buy it if it ever breaks out. So their order would be buy 100 ABC at 51 stop. So if it ever trades at 51 or above, it becomes a market order to buy. If it never hits their price, order is not fulfilled. Someone might also be saying, you know what else could be happening here? Again, it's kind of chopping sideways here. And it can't get below 45, but what if it ever does? What if it ever trades at 44? Now, maybe the market's changed its mind too, but to the downside, right? Now they're willing to sell it for less than they have been. So maybe that could start a new downtrend and they want to maybe ride the trip down. So in that case, instead, they can place an order to sell or sell short in this case, sell short 100 ABC at 49 stop. So if it ever hits up, oh, not 49, 44 stop. So if it ever trades at or below 44, it becomes a market order to sell to sell the stock short, right? Figuring that a downtrend might continue. So that's the per so that's the other thing here about how they use stop orders, either to protect their investments from loss or to try and lock in some gains if they have any, or to play these kind of breakout situations. All right, are you good with this part? Is there any part of that that's not totally 100 percent clear just yet? Okay, thank you, Karina. Okay. All right. The, before I do, before I change this about order reductions here, uh, thanks, Amy. Let me give you something here, a little tool to help you with this. Okay. On your scratch paper or your other marker board, draw a horizontal line. And this horizontal line represents the current market price. Above the line, write the words slobs. Slobs, that's S-L-O-B-S, slobs. Below the line, write the word bliss. That's uh, right. The, uh, all right, come on. 
the word bliss. That's B-L-I-S-S, -S. bliss. All right, so the, what we're going to remember this as, right, your, your phrase that pays here, okay, is, is, come on, <laughs> I hate when it does this. It is slobs above and bliss below. This little memory trick to help you remember what orders go above the current price and what go below the current price. Slobs above. So above the current price, that's slobs. That's SL for sell limit and BS for buy stop. These orders go above the current price. Below the current price, the orders go below, it's bliss below. That's BL for buy limit and SS for sell stop. Okay. All right. So that's what will help you out. And that's your little memory trick here. Okay. Buzz above and bliss below. All right. So let's say, let's say this. Okay. All right. ABC is $50 and your customer, your customer wants to buy at $45. What type of order will you enter for your customer? All right. So the order they want to buy, okay. So they want to buy at a price that's below the current price, right? It is bliss below and it's a buy order. What orders go below the current price? Buy limit order. So we're going to buy 100 ABC at 45. Again, if I just put a price, it's understood that that's a limit price. What if I said ABC is $50 and your customer wants to sell at $55? So they put an order that's above the current price, right? It's slobs above and it's a sell order. So what type of a sell order is above the current price? That's the SL in slobs. Right, so the so sell limit order, sell 100 ABC at 55. Again, it's understood that that's a limit price. What if ABC is 55 and your customer wants to sell at 45? Now what type of order will you enter? The order they want to enter is below the current price, it's bliss below, and it's a sell order. What type of sell order is below the current price? That's the SS and bliss, sell stop sell 100 ABC at 45 stop. Notice again, I have to specify stop. If I didn't specify it, I said this, sell at 100 ABC at 45, that's a limit order. This says sell it for no less than 45. <laughs> and it's 50 now, so it would sell immediately. And I bring that up because I've had discussions <laughs> with our firm's customers who wanted to enter a, a stop order, but actually entered a limit order. And go, how come it sold immediately? Well, because you asked us to. Okay. All right. And if ABC is 50 and your customer wants to buy at uh, 55, but no more than 56. Okay. Now, what type of order are we going to enter for our customer? Okay. It's an uh, order above the current price. Right? It's slobs above, and it's a buy order. That's the BS in slobs. It's a buy stop order, but they specified they don't want to pay more than a certain price. So we're going to buy 100 ABC at 55 stop limit 56. All right. That's how we enter orders, okay? All right, any other questions? Anything else about this, right? This can be pretty important and definitely, right? This is real world stuff. All right, a couple more examples. Well, I don't know if I can come up with any more examples because <laughs> uh, I, I just did one of everything. But uh, okay, what, what, what could I do, right? Uh, let's see, uh, what can I do that's different? Um, ABC is $65. Customer wants to sell if it falls to 62, but not less than $61.50. <laughs> so who can tell me what type of order are we going to enter now? Type in the order the way I typed it. 
that is assuming there's like 100 shares. Sell stop, almost Kimberly, but remember, a stop order becomes a market order if it ever executes, right? But they don't want to trade at whatever, do they? Ah, sell stop limit. So how would I? How would we type in the order? How would I enter this order using using the format that I did? Can you can you do that too? Can you can you give it a try? Sell. There you go. Let's sell 100 ABC at 65 stop, 6150 limit. Oh, actually, not 65. Not exactly 65, right? Because <laughs> it's 65 dollars now, right? But if you said 62 stop, limit 6150, you'd be spot on perfect. Okay. All right, Jason. Okay, sells. Well, Jason says sell $65 ABC. No, we wouldn't put in the price that it is. We put in the price that they want, but we do want to know how many shares. Okay. So Alexis, right, having read on it here, yeah, perfect. That's exactly how it. Okay. So Jason, in place of that $65 that you typed in before the ABC. Uh, yeah, you probably put you put in the number of shares they want to sell. Okay, all right. So before we go on and start talking about, um, actually, no, there's just two slides left. So let's go ahead and just uh, lose on this real quick. All right, order reduction. So open orders, right? Uh, oh, the the orders that are below the current price, okay, the bliss orders are going to be adjusted based on dividends and stock splits. Because we see when a stock goes X dividend, remember X means without, without dividend. Remember that the price of the stock is adjusted on the stock exchange by the amount of the dividend, right? On the morning uh, at the opening trade, right? Uh, 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 on the X dividend date. So any open order that's below that price, well, could get, uh, could get activated or could get fulfilled for no other reason than because the price of the stock went down on the X dividend date, right? And that's the only reason why. So to prevent that from kind of happening, then any open order that's be, that's you know below the market price, like the, the bliss orders, are also going to be adjusted downwards by the amount of the dividend. So if we had an order, if they if we paid you know I don't know a fifteen cents a share dividend, and we had an open buy order or a sell stop order, right? Our our prices are also going to be reduced by fifteen cents, unless somebody actually says otherwise. Unless somebody enters an order that says do not reduce, DNR, do not reduce. Okay, which by the way, at a hospital is going to have a totally different meaning than it has here. <laughs> okay, DNR, right? Do not reduce. So that means they have to specifically say do not reduce their, their buy limit price or sell stop price on the X dividend date. I never once took a DNR order. Nobody even asked about it. It never came up in conversation. Okay, nevertheless, it is there. All right, now what about in the case of a stock split? Okay, so a stock split or a stock dividend, right? Now then they're in a stock split or dividend. Uh, investors have more shares of stock, but now each share is proportionally smaller value. So therefore, any open order is going to be adjusted proportionally to reflect the stock split or dividend. Here's our example. It's a simple one. Buy 100 shares of ABC at $50 a share. Now remember, 100 shares at $50 a share, right? That's a, right, a $5,000 order, right? Okay, right, that's a $5,000 order. The company announces a two for one stock split. Two for one, investors get two shares for every one that they have now. So they get twice the number, but each is now half the price. Well, then any open order has got to also be adjusted proportionally. So the order to buy 100 at 50 is going to write twice the number, half the price, becomes 200 shares at $25 a share. And two hundred and twenty-five dollars is still a five thousand dollar order, right? So five thousand dollar value. The value's got to stay the same before and after the adjustment, right? That's how you know you did the math right. Okay. Now, finally, here's some miscellaneous orders. Again, extremely rare that they're ever entered, uh, but it does happen sometimes. Okay, a not held order. Now, this can be important. Market not held. This means that the customer is going to let their the register rep or let the floor traders at the firm, right? The, the people I have on the floor of the stock exchange, see if they can work the order. Give them their discretion, give them their trust, see if they can actually think they can get a better price than the market price, right? Go into the trading crowd and see if they can't negotiate a better order. Okay, now keep in mind, it's called the not held order because the firm is not held to price and time of execution. 
if they place market orders, right, they need instant execution. But this one says, okay, I'll allow you to work the order. Now, maybe they'll work it out and they'll get a better price. On the other hand, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll try to find a better price, but the price actually gets worse. <laughs> that can happen too. And they'll have to just accept the order. All right. Now, uh, also, okay, when someone places an order for multiple lots, right, more than 100 shares, now there's a chance that if someone says, I want to buy like 500 shares at a certain price, at a, at a limit order, right, like buy 500, okay, like buy 500 ABC at you know, $50. And it's understood that if they can't get all the shares, all 500 shares at $50, they'll get as many as they can. So sometimes they get a partial fulfillment of the order. So, right. So the other the trade confirmation back saying they bought 200 ABC at 50, leaving another 300 shares still to be unfulfilled, right? They'll still try and work the order, but they, you know, some, maybe they can't. So someone says, I don't want a partial fulfillment of my order. So they can enter that order as fill or kill. In a fill or kill order, the order must be fulfilled in its entirety and immediately. And if they can't fill all 500 shares at $50 a share immediately, they'll cancel the order, right? They fill, or, fill it or kill it, right? The order is just canceled. So they've only got like a moment, right? A minute maybe to place that, to fill that order. If someone is willing to place a get a, a partial fulfillment of the order, but they want the order filled immediately, like instant execution or not at all, uh, that would be called immediate or cancel, which you might see as a, as an IOC. Okay, see, I tried to enter this. Okay, we'll called immediate cancel IOC, immediate or cancel. This says, all right, well here it is, right? I want to buy ten thousand shares of XYZ at twenty dollars, immediate or cancel. So only 9,000 shares are available, so they'll fill the order for 9,000 shares. The remaining 1,000 shares cancel, right? They can't get it, right? They'll take a partial fulfillment, but the order must be fulfilled immediately. In an all or none order, all or none, which you might see as A-O-N, all or none. They will not accept a partial fulfillment of the order, but if they cannot fill the entire order, they don't cancel immediately. They'll let the broker dealer firm try to work the order. The customer wants to buy 10,000 shares of XYZ at $20, all or none. They'll only willing to accept 10,000 shares. If they can't get all 10,000 shares that they want at the price, they won't fulfill the order, but they'll still continue to work the order. Okay, now by the way, orders with restrictions like this, restricted orders, right, do not have a place online on the stock exchange, on the on the order, on the specialist order book. Those orders have to be fulfilled manually. And the reason someone might do them, especially if they're trading like low price penny stocks, right, which have a rather thin market to them, right? They don't trade a whole lot. <laughs> so even in order for 10,000 shares, that's even that order could, could, could move the market. Now, if they don't want all of them, they, they'll, if they don't get everything they want at the price they want, they don't want any. Okay. All right. So uh, the, the, yeah, the only time I've entered them was an all or none order. And again, that's only when someone's placing like a big trade on a thinly traded stock. Okay, all right, and with that, we're now at 12 minutes past the hour, so we got to the end of the section. So let's go ahead and take a break. And let's return at 22 past the hour. And as always, if you have any other questions, or if you'd like me to go back to a previous slide, please feel free to unmute or type a question in the chat on the control panel, and I'll reply to you accordingly. On that, I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, well, so welcome back from break, and our next section now, we're going to move on to Chapter 8, which is on trade processing and settlement, right? What happens actually after a trade gets done? Now that we know how do we enter an order, how does the order actually get fulfilled? All right, so first off, order tickets and prohibited trading practices. So first off, an order ticket as well. Now, they used to actually have paper tickets on carbon, you know, with carbon copies, and that you'd have to see, I'd fill out the forms and send it in. In fact, um, my great uncle who used to work on Wall Street, you know, and, um, okay, in the in 1950s or so, right, um, they, they had to be on, on paper order tickets. So he'd fill out a form, and and they, they had this, um, and they clip it to, like, a clothesline. He had this line actually going across the across the hallways, and you clip it on a clothespin, and it'd go into the, uh, to the wire room from there. <laughs> okay. All right, so, but this is what an order ticket looks like. And by the way, it's all computerized now, of course, but, hey, if the computers go down, you got to be ready with the carbon copy paper tickets. So this is what an order ticket might look like. So first off, you're gonna say, well, what? Well, you have to have things like whether it's a buy or sell order. And if it's a sell order, 
whether it's selling long, right, means selling something they own, or selling short. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Ashley, are we going to take the exam? Yes, we are. Okay, we're going to take this a little bit later on. Okay, or do they selling short, which means that they have, um, right, that's something they don't own. Okay, now notice that under selling short, they're selling borrowed shares. Regulation SHO specifically says, right, SHO for short sales. This says that in order to do a short sale, the firm must arrange to borrow shares and deliver them upon upon selling them. And if they can't arrange to borrow shares, if they can't find shares to borrow to lend to the customer, they have to cancel the order. Otherwise, right, if they sell shares without actually finding shares to sell or selling them short representing they own it, but they really don't, that's called a naked short sale. That's a violation. All right, so we have to play, check the appropriate box, right, or, or circle, long, short, or exempt. Uh, the size, okay, whether, of course, if it's selling stock, it's number of shares. If you're, if you're trading bonds, the number of bonds, right? The, uh, you know, the face amount of bonds. If it's options, right? How many option contracts? If they want the employer as a market order, now if they're placing a market order, they just say market. But if they're going to enter a, a limit order, they put the price they want to pay, if it's a buy order, or what they sell to sell it for, it's a sell order. And whether it's a stop order or a stop limit order. In that case, they have to specify both the stop price and the limit price. Also, how long do they want the order in force? Day order only, that's only good for the day, or GTC, good till canceled. Do they want a do not reduce on it, or is there a discretionary order? Notice there's a thing for discretion. That means that the customer has allowed the rep to use their discretion as to what to buy or sell. So in this case, it's the registered rep who's placing the order. Name of the security, maybe a ticker symbol also. So if it's like, well, <laughs> some of them are pretty obvious. General Motors is ticker symbol GM, but some of them are not so obvious. Southwest Airlines is ticker symbol LUV because they fly out of Love Field, Texas. Uh, the customer's name, the account number, and the registered rep's number, right? Who took the order, right? If you have uh, the order, right, you're given a certain ID and the date of the trade. And notice there's also a box for manager approval, right? Managers, supervisors have to approve orders, right, on the day they're entered. They don't have to approve them beforehand. They can do it after. That's why there's a settlement period on trades. So if there's a problem. So it gives you the, the security's name, order size, duration, if it was discretionary order, um, okay, all those things here. Um, execution price, so if the order was entered, uh, whether the order was solicited or unsolicited. A solicited order means the, the rep calls the customer with a recommendation. Unsolicited means the customer calls and says, this is what I want to trade. Now, that can be important because remember, to solicit an order, call a customer with a recommendation, any recommendations you make must be suitable to the person you make it to. Right, so making unsuitable transactions, right, is a, is a violation. Uh, the manager's approval, like it says, right, uh, this means they ended by the end of the day, and the rep's name or some ID number that you're given, and any alterations to the executor if the order is fulfilled but it has to be completed somewhere or altered in some way. Yes, the order must be approved in writing. All right, firms are required to get best execution for their customers. So they're expected not to just uh, execute a trade, but to work and find the best available price. Now that can include looking around and quoting from different market centers to see if they're find the best available price. So maybe they find a quote stock on the quote on the New York Stock Exchange, but maybe the same stock is also trading on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, and the Philadelphia price is a little, maybe a little bit different than the New York price. Maybe a little better. In that case, they're expected to route the order to Philadelphia to find the best available price. But how do you know what's the best available price? Some things, just the price may be just the consideration, but we also have to consider things like size and type of transaction, right? If it's, for example, a restricted order, like an all or none restriction, that's far more difficult sometimes to execute. So we have to consider that as well. How actively is the stock traded? If it's an over-the-counter stock, a thinly traded security, it can be, again, more difficult to fill that order. So it's based on a whole lot of factors. Now, notice it says about trading ahead of customers. Customer orders come first before placing the orders for the firm. Front running is, a, is something, a practice of, well, sticking your order in ahead of a customer's order. Especially if you've got an institutional customer, right? One of your corporate customers going to do a big block trade. And you know it's big enough to move the market. And you think, hmm, I know. I'll stick my order in first. I'll put the big giant order right in behind me. I'll let it move the market, then I'll get out. No, that's not allowed, right? Right, firm, right, customer orders must come ahead of the firm or the registered rep's orders. Right, you're not allowed to compete. Oh, would you like to look at the, uh, let's see, side 176 again? Okay, that's this one here. Okay, 
and good and then 177 right here okay all right jason did you get what you need to take a snapshot or anything all right good deal okay all right so that is okay that's a prohibited practice backing away all right backing away see okay so a dealer in security our market makers are dealers in securities and as a dealer they have to pay, maintain a two-sided market. They have to post the price they're willing to buy it for and the price they're willing to sell it for and the number of round lots, right? A, hundred share, a round lot is 100 shares that they're committed to buy or sell. And they're expected to honor that price quote. Well, if someone places an order based on this price quote that they've, that they've given and then the market maker doesn't fulfill that price, right? That's a violation called backing away. They have to honor the price and size that they're getting. All right, trading pools are pump and dump. So that's where, that's basically, it's a market manipulation. Um, trying to use these deceptive marketing. So they could, for example, uh, like, okay, like spreading rumors, for example. Hey, guess what I heard is a takeover target kind of thing, right? So they're trying to entice investors, right, to buy into it and therefore pump up the price. Then when they do that, then they're going to sell their shares on their unwitting victims who paid a whole lot more than they should have because the price got pumped up like that. Okay. Now, as it says that penny stocks are vulnerable to this, right? Because, I mean, you couldn't do that with like Walmart or something. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of easier ways to verify those rumors on Walmart, but thinly traded stocks, right? They're over the counter market, not a whole lot of news on them, not a whole lot of easy to get information about them. So it might be more easy to do these pumping dumps. Besides which, penny stocks, since they don't trade much, even a small amount of trade can push up the price. And even a small change in the price is like a big percentage of the value. Uh, was GameStop an example of that? Not exactly. Um, first off, it wasn't really, I don't think a really unlawful practice, but a bunch of people said, uh, honest, on Reddit said, they know there's a very heavy short interest in GameStop. Short interest means how many shares have been sold short, especially by hedge funds. And in fact, I think they had noticed that more shares had been sold short than actually could be sold and were available. So, that all right there suggests something was going on wrong. So they started buying into it, started pushing the price up. These hedge funds, because they started going up in price and they started losing money, they got to start buying back again to cover their short position to limit their losses, which again caused the price to go up again and kind of this whole cascading thing. So not exactly pumping them because it wasn't, I don't think, really an illegal practice. Don't know it was entirely ethical either, but all right. A wash trade is. Um, Okay, there's a, there's a thing called wa a wash trade, but also related to that, okay, is a match sale and another one called painting the tape. All right, what it is, is basically it's a market manipulation of creating false trading volume. Well, basically, in a wash trade, that means there's no real change of ownership. Basically, someone's just trading between their own different accounts. Match sale is two people trading between each other, and painting the tape is a series of unmatched transactions, uh, but all done basically as a market manipulation, basically creating false trading volume, just trading among each other to make it appear as if a stock that normally doesn't get a whole lot of activity is all of a sudden moving up on much higher than normal volume. Someone might look at that and say, hey, something's going on here. I better get in on this. But again, it's just nothing but a scheme. All right, marking the open or marking the close, that's placing a trade and trying to manipulate what is seen in the next day's newspapers. Right? Because remember, what's reported in next day's newspaper? The open, high, low, and close of the day. So marking the open or marking the close is trading right at market or close or falsely trading, making false reports on trades to try and affect you know, what's seen in the newspaper next day. By the way, I have no idea how they do this, <laughs> All right, but apparently they do. And do it often, or at least did it often enough <laughs> that they came up with a name for it. <laughs> Trading ahead of research. All right, now firms, right? Now firms can do put out research reports and they can make buy, sell, or hold recommendations. And when a major firm or an analysis firm puts out a buy, sell, or hold, right, you can see an instant of impact on the market price of the stock. They put out a buy recommendation on something, price shoots up. They put out a sell recommendation, as soon as it hits the newswire, price falls down. So they say, hmm, before we put out this buy recommendation, what if we buy a whole lot of shares ourselves, put out this buy recommendation, watch the price shoot up. All right, that's okay. I think that's pretty obvious. All right, 
broker dealers, right? The brokerage, right? A stock brokering firm is called a broker dash dealer because it can act as a broker or as a dealer on a transaction, right? As an agent matching up a buyer and seller or as a dealer buying a trading from inventory. But they can't do both at the same time on the same trade. They can't charge a commission as a broker and get a markup as a dealer on the exact same trade. And that, that's just prohibited, right? Is they can't even like customer can't say, oh, I admit it, okay, yeah, allow it. Interpositioning is sticking someone else between a, well, another trade between between their firm, the customer's orders and someone else, right? So putting someone else in the middle, uh, often trying to get, you know, maybe they're trying to trade them against their prices like that, uh, to try and trade against another firm, right? Maybe to fill their orders too. All right, they cannot normally do that unless it results in the customer getting a better price. Now, since firms normally aren't allowed to do this interpositioning, stick someone else in the middle of their trade, its burden of proof falls onto the firm to prove that the customer got a better order. Okay, so they don't do it because, like it says here, if they're trading to multiple firms, they could cause the customer to get a higher price, not a lower price. Okay, so those are some examples of right, prohibited trading practices, right? Front running, backing away, pump and dump, painting the tape, marking the close, trading ahead, interpositioning. So you know if it, if it ends with ing, it's probably something you're not supposed to do. Okay. All right, now let's talk about the clearing and settlement. Okay, thanks, Kimberly. All right, let's talk about the trading, uh, clearing and settlement. So this is actually kind of the behind the scenes stuff how buyers and sellers actually get matched up. So the trade clearing basically is involving so that both basically everybody agrees to the transaction and behind the scenes to ensure that the buyer gets the securities, the seller gets the cash. So behind the scenes here is the depository trust corporation. Securities are actually deposit or held, often in book entry form. So when a trade gets done, right, is there's a clear there's a, a clearing period, right? So they clear the trade, to ensure buyer gets securities, seller gets cash. In fact, these clearing corporations, uh, the National Securities Clearing Corporation, NSCC, uh, on their own website, right, they describe themselves as the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. So they're ensuring that they get all matched up, right? The firms that represent the buyer, the firms that represent the seller, use the clearing corporations to make sure that money and securities change hands. Okay, um, this mentions different types of broker dealers here. So some firms are clearing firms. Now those, the clearing firms actually execute the trades and they have custody of customer's assets. And they have people who work on the floor of the stock exchanges, right? And have market making activity to execute buy and sell orders. So they're the clearing firms that actually execute and clear the trades, ensuring buyer and seller gets up. But there are other firms too, that are the smaller firms, the boutique firms. They don't do the actual transactions. They don't do the trades. They work with one of these clearing firms. Uh, those are firms like Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, right? Okay, uh, the big big companies like that, uh, right? To uh, to actually execute the trades. So they call them introducing broker dealers because they they introduce their customer to the clearing firm. So that might be a boutique kind of firm. I, I don't know if a name right off the head off the top of my head that I know for sure is an introducing broker dealer. Probably because they're so small, I wouldn't know them otherwise. All right, but they they, uh, they they work with their customer, they take the customer's orders, they give their customers their statements, right? They take their order, they, they work with them, right? Do their financial planning with them, but they handle the order, maybe they trade off with Merrill Lynch or something like that to actually execute the trade. The Options Clearing Corporation, the OCC, they do the same thing, but in this case for options. So when someone buys an option, someone else sells it, so they ensure seller gets cash, buyer gets the contract. If someone ex exercises their option contract using their rights to buy or sell at this fixed pre-agreed price, the options clearing corporation again assumes that the buyer and seller get matched up against each other. Money and securities change hands. Uh, so on the day of the trade, right, comparisons are sent to the well, to the other broker dealer firm. So Merrill Lynch is smithing with um, uh, with Charles Schwab or something like that. Okay, and they sure the terms match, right? That they've got the same order and they're going to compare the trade. Well, if they find that there's an order here that they can't find it, um, okay, uh, well, they're going to have some sort of problem here. So they, what they call is they decay the trade. DK stands for don't know. 
which means that we don't have a matching trade here. So they have to resolve that within 20 minutes. The example here says your firm receives a comparison executed at $50, and the other right, the other trade shows the same at 60. Well, there's there's a mismatch here. <laughs> so the DK, the comparison, we don't know what that is, so we have to deal with it. Oh, Alexis, your work is an introducing broker dealer? Oh, that's interesting. Well, just curious, Alexis, what, what firm do you work for? So I can maybe use that as an example. If you have the chance. Oh, M.S. Howells and Company. All right. Well, like you said, I, <laughs> okay, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that one. But all right, but it's good that you know that. Thank you for providing that. So that's uh, so if anyone ever asks, I'll have a I'll have a real life example. Uh, question says, uh, what promotes or causes a trade in big corporations? Um, well, I'm not sure if I understand the question, Jason. If um, causes a trade in big corporations, you mean what causes the do don't know? Like Charles Schwab, I think, yeah. Well, of course, they got it. Well, uh, one of Merrill Lynch customers places a buy order <laughs> and they go to the stock exchange and they get sell it from someone, right? Some uh, a Charles Schwab customer has a sell order. <laughs> so they're, they're representing their customers, right? Yeah, that, that that's what they're doing there. Okay. Okay. All right. Settlement period. This can be very important here. The settlement period is the amount of time it takes for money and securities to actually change hands. And the settlement period is for almost everything is two business days following the trade date. They abbreviate that as T plus two for trade date plus two business days. So if today's uh, today's Wednesday, it is Wednesday, right? All right. So if our extra order executes today, we're going to count two business days, uh, Thursday and Friday. So Friday is the settlement date of the trade. The settlement date is the day the, the buyer gets the securities, the seller gets the cash. In fact, if you ever look at a customer's account history, right? You'll look at it, right? You'll see that it's the settlement date of the trade, right? The, okay, from the buyer's point of view, right? That's the day that the shares arrive and the money leaves. And if you look at the seller's account, the settlement date is the day the shares leave and the money arrives. Almost everything is two business days to settle. The exception are government bonds, treasury bonds, and options, trading options. They are a one business day settlement. So the money and security change hands the next business day. Now there is a thing called a cash settlement, and the settlement then the the the, uh, the the settlement date is the same day as the trade date, as long as the orders are fulfilled before 2:30 p.m. Eastern time. So in that case, they make a special arrangement for the money and securities to actually change hands. So the buyer takes possession. See, the, the settlement date of the day trade is the day the buyer takes possession. And that's the day the buyer is now on the books. Their buyer's name is on the books with the transfer agent as owning the shares as of that date. That can be very important, especially when it comes to dividend payments. Because the dividend payment, right, there's a, there's a, a record date. Anyone who's on the books as a shareholder of record on close of business on this day gets the next dividend payment. Well, it takes two business days for that person's name to be on the books. They don't actually take possession for two business days. So therefore, if they want to make sure they get the next dividend payment, they got to execute their trade at least two business days before the record date that's set by the company's board of directors. Because if they trade it one day before the record date, it takes two days to get there. And so it doesn't arrive. They don't take possession until one day after the record date, one day too late. That can be pretty important. There is also a thing called the seller's option. All right, that's that when the, the seller cannot deliver securities on time. Right? Maybe they have a paper certificate and they got to go dig it out of the safety deposit box or something like that. Uh, there is a thing called a when as an if issued settlement. This is for new securities when they've announced their issue, but the certificates aren't available yet. All right. By the way, I, I worked as a rep. I never once took a cash settlement trade, never once took a settlement option, never once used a when as or if issued. Nobody even asked about it. It never came up in conversation. But these things do exist, okay? And if, but if it weren't for the test, I might not even have known about it, okay? So it's still a testable topic, even though they hardly do it. Now, when someone sells their securities, as if they, now again, most people have their investments on deposit in their accounts, what they call book entry formatting, right? That just means it's recorded electronically. 
but some people still have a paper stock certificate that's got their name on it. Well, when they sell their securities, they have to deliver that paper certificate, and it has to be in good delivery too. One of which is that, first off, it has to be endorsed on the back. So they have to sign on the back of it, and it must be signed exactly the way it is on the front. So if it says, you know, William Smith on the front, they can't sign it Bill Smith on the back. And if, if their name is misspelled on the front, they have to misspell it on the back. I mean, seriously, it's that, it's that picky about it. Uh, there's another way to do that, though, and it's called the stock power, or if they're trading bonds, a bond power, which is basically an attachment to the physical stock certificate that has a customer's signature on it. And the signatures have to be medallion guaranteed. That's not the same as notarized. Right? It's just basically someone else in another special way guaranteeing the signature. That the person signing it that they are they are so they are now what if you got a stock certificate that's been through the washing machine and comes up all torn and tattered well that's no good you have to make good delivery of that of that paper certificate now the uh certificate if it is all torn up if it's been validated by the transfer agent remember the transfer agent is the is the firm that keeps track of who owns how many shares they've got the list of shareholders so if they validate over the issuer then they could deliver it but otherwise if their stock certificate is all torn up and mutilated, they'll have to give it back to the transfer agent to get a new one issued to them. And this takes a while. So <laughs> it takes work. All right. In delivery, like we've remember we said before, that stocks are traded in round lots of 100 shares. It's the standard unit of trading. So to make good delivery, you have to be able to take stock certificates and stack them up so that they can be right, stacked up into 400 share units, right? 100 shares at a time. The example here, 400 share order could be four certificates of 100 shares, eight for 50, because then you can put two in a stack here that adds up to 100. One stack, well, okay, one, one star certificate says you have over 400 shares, but you can't do 10 certificates of 40 shares each because you cannot stack them in such a way that they add up to 100 shares. Okay, so that's when they can't do it. All right, bond certificates are, uh, well, again, remember bonds are $1,000 par value but could have up to $100,000 on one certificate. Interesting, again, interestingly enough, they might even test you on this. I've never, right, we never see them anymore. Okay. Customer confirmations. So whenever someone places a trade, they get a one sheet document that's got all the details of that transaction. That's their confirmation. And since people don't usually have paper stock certificates with their name on it, that confirmation acts like their receipt, right? That the, 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 the fact that they've made this trade. First off, they can keep it for their records, and they might want that, you know, around tax time, okay, to record their capital gains or losses. But it is also their evidence. So if you, you know, if you bought a stereo at Best Buy and you want to return it, you got to have your receipt. Well, if you have a problem with your trade, you need your trade confirmation. The confirmation is basically a detail of the transaction. And you can see the list here of the things they have, right, including the customer name and address, uh, the firm, whether it was done in a cash account or margin account, name or price, the size of the trade, the price of the trade. Uh, whether it was a buy or sell order, if it was a bond trade, what was the accrued interest on the trade? Uh, they also have to do, was this done as an agency basis or a principal basis, as a broker or as a dealer? And if it was done as a broker, they have to show the commission. Right? If it was an, as a dealer transaction, NASDAQ anyway, they have to show the markup or markdown. Okay, uh, Payment for order flow. So firms can, well, basically firms that say, okay, if you send some transaction business our way uh, to the broker dealer, they'll say, okay, well, They'll give them some some part of the of the commission or the part of the markup or markdown for that. By the way, I know this sounds like a conflict of interest, but it actually is okay, right? As long as it's disclosed, okay. As long as it's disclosed, because it does help keep costs low for broker dealer firms, and therefore they can charge smaller commissions. All right, the QCIP number. QCIP that stands for let's see, it's Committee for Uniform Securities Identification Procedure, or maybe it's Protocol. I think it's Procedure. Basically, it's like a serial number for securities. After all, like a company like General Motors, right? How many securities? They've got General Motors common stock, probably different classes of General Motors preferred stock. Who knows how many bonds GM has ever issued? Well, to make sure we're all thinking of the same bond here, right? Each one is given a specific unit. So every bond issue, not each, each individual bond, but the bond issue. So GM has sold, you know, 100 million bonds Okay, right. Uh, uh, that all you know, due in 6.5% matures in July 2040. 
something like that, right? So all those bonds that are 6% bonds that you're in July 2040 have a QCIP number to identify that specifically so you don't end up getting confused with maybe any other bonds that GM has issued. Okay. Uh, also about the customer, now the MSRB, now that's the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. So they're the regulatory organization that oversees the municipal bond industry. Now the municipal bond industry, sometimes their rules are different than they are on FINRA rules. Be a little bit cautious on the test because if it tells you right the, what the MSR, if this test question says, according to MSRB rules, they sometimes are different from FINRA rules. So it's just a matter of like making sure you find the right set of rules. So the MSRB says the customer confirmation has to have all this information too. Who is the issuer, whether it's a city or county or state government, interest rate, the maturity date, if it's callable, when the bond is callable, is it a is it a general obligation bond or is it a revenue bond? If it's a revenue, where does the money come from that pays it? So if it's like say something like water and sewer facility, for example, that would tell you. Uh, the yield and dollar price of the transaction. Remember, yield is the percentage rate of return. And if the transaction is non-callable, they'll also give the price, right, uh, the real to maturity. If the bond is callable, you always have to give the yield of either the yield if it's held to maturity or if it's called away. The, the, and the worst, they also give them the worst case scenario. They call it yield to worst. If you recall, with a bond, let's say, for example, we have our seesaw here. When the price of a bond goes down, the nominal yield stays the same. The current yield goes up. The yield to maturity, when it's held all the way to the end, goes up even more than that. But the yield to call would go up even more than that because if a bond is called in early, basically it accelerates the whole process. Instead of wait 10 years to get their money back, they get it back in five. And so that would cause the yield to call to increase. So which one do they put on the trade confirmation? You've got to give them a worst case scenario. So in that case, they quote the yield to maturity because it's lower than the yield to call. Of course, the exact opposite happens when the bond is trading at a premium. If the price went up, the nominal yield went, stays the same. The current yield goes down. The yield to maturity when it's held to the end goes down more. Yield to call goes down more, again, because it speeds everything up. In that case, the yield to call is lower than yield to maturity. That's the worst case scenario. So you give them yield to call. That way people don't call and you know, complain later, says, hey, you promised me this yield, but I got that yield because you got called away from it. All right. What other information? Okay, anyway, you can kind of see the things here, but things like, you know, the date to date, that's the date that the bonds actually start accruing interest, might not be actually sold to investors by that date. That's the date that interest starts to accrue. Whether the securities are fully registered to principal only or book entry, right? Book entry means it's recorded electronically. Fully registered means they know they have a registration of who the account, the investor is, and if they get the, uh, and who the, who the interest payments go to. Registered principal only means they just know who owns the bond, but they don't know who gets the interest payments. Are they subject to federal tax or the alternative minimum tax? Right. People usually buy municipal bonds because they're federal tax exempt, but some are subject maybe to the alternative minimum tax. If it is, you got to let them know. They don't want to get a nasty surprise later. <laughs> All right. Securities have been pre-refunded, -re okay, or the date of pre-refunded. That means basically they've purchased... Um, They've maybe done another bond offering, use that money to buy treasury bonds and put those treasury bonds in escrow to pay off these existing bonds once they become mature or once they are, are called or to call, get called away. Original issue discount, right? That would be a zero coupon bond. Bought at a discount, mature at face value. And if they're not in $1,000 units, well, you have to explain it. Again, for the test, go ahead and assume it's $1,000 units. Every bond is $1,000 face amount unless you're specifically told otherwise, and I really doubt you'll be told otherwise. Okay. All right, accrued interest. Okay, right. Accrued interest. When, okay, so a buyer buys a bond and he buys it from someone else, right? Secondary market trade. Well, you know that bonds pay interest every six months and whoever owns the bond, right, collects the coupon, right? Tears off the coupon and collects six months worth of interest. But someone bought it from someone else maybe in between interest payments. So the person who bought it basically owes some money, right, to the person who sold it to them for that person's prorated share of the, of the next interest payment. Okay, 
So we have to sometimes ask, well, how many days of accrued interest does the buyer owe the seller? And then maybe even in dollars and cents, how much does the buyer owe the seller? Well, to work this out, to figure this out, for corporate and municipal bonds, they're going to work on what's called the 3360 convention. They're basically going to add it up by saying that every month is 30 days long, right? January, February, March, and April are all 30 days long, and there are 360 days in a year. They, now, this is just to do the math, right? Treasury bonds, however, well, I guess they've just got to be a whole lot pickier about it, right? So it's a bigger market, and they've got to be more precise. So they use actual days and 365 days in a year. So when you're talking about treasury bonds, January is 31 days, February is 28, don't worry about leap year. March is 31, April is 30. Okay, so the question might be, how many days of accrued interest does the buyer or the seller? Interest accrues from the morning of the last payment date until the day before the settlement date. Because remember, the buyer takes possession on settlement date, the seller still had it up until the day before. So on Tuesday, March 3rd, a customer buys a corporate bond regular way settlement. What's regular way? Two business days. So if we bought it on March 3rd, the settlement date is, right, we count Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday, March 5th is the settlement date. So when will interest accrue? From the morning of the last payment date, that says the bond date pays interest, January 1st, July 1st. They call it a J&J &J bond, January and July, right, or February and August, March or September, right? So the bonds start paying interest January and July 1st. So the interest accrue from the morning of January 1st, right, we include uh, holidays and weekends, up until the day before settlement date. Well, the day before settlement would be March 4th. How many days of that? Well, we're just going to assume that January is 30 days, February is 30 days, and there are four days in March, from March 1st to March 4th, the day before settlement. That's a total of 64 days. Okay. Um, how much might the buyer have to pay the seller? Well, let's just say, let's assume for a second that it was a, uh, I'll just say a 5% bond. So how much does the bond pay, right? How much interest does the bond pay per year? A 5% bond pays $50 per year. So we now have to figure out, if we know it's $50 per year, how much interest is that accrues on a daily basis? Now, to do the math, they're just going to work under the idea that Every the days are 300, there are 360 days in a year. So we're going to take this $50, divide by 360 days. And we come up with now, this is definitely calculator time. Okay, going to grab my calculator and I'm going to take 50, divide by 360, and I get well, what I get in my calculator is 0 0.13888888. All right, so okay, so. 13.8, 13.8, okay, just under 14 cents a day. All right, so how much does the buyer owe the seller? Well, now I'm not going to clear my calculator. I know it's got, you know, it goes on all these decimal places, but I'm not going to clear my calculator now. I'm going to multiply this by 64 days. And therefore, I multiply by 64, and I get, well, I'm going to have to, now I have to round to the nearest penny, $8.80, whoops, $8.80 and 89 cents so the buyer owes the seller 64 days worth of interest which is 50 dollars a year is nearly 14 cents a day times 64 days eight dollars and 89 cents that's how we do accrued interest all right lastly then we say a bond is trading flat if it is not trading with accrued interest and there's no right so there, there's, there's no accrued interest that has to be paid from buyer to seller which bonds trade flat? Well, if the bonds are in default, that means they have their, they've stopped paying interest on them. Okay, they're defaulted on the loan. Income bonds are also called adjustment bonds, which are out of bankruptcy proceeds, and they only pay interest and payments if the cor if the corporation has the issue to do so. Zero coupon bonds because right they don't make regular interest payments, and commercial paper also because they're like zero coupon bonds too. They trade flat. Okay, so there's no accrued interest on those trades. All right, with that in mind, we're right at straight up to the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and take a, um, let's see, do you think we can do this in 10 minutes, in 50 minutes? Um, let's see. No, let's, 
All right, let's just take a five minute break this time because I want to make sure we have enough time here. And during our break, okay, return at five past the hour. But in this case, go on to your uh, go on to your past perfect, log on to past perfect, and open up mastery test number one. All right, I think I mentioned to you already. If you've already taken mastery test one, go ahead and take it again. Here's another thing, right? I've had the chance to you know source some of your grades. If you're getting a grade in a chapter exam or some of these, you know those uh, those you know test your understandings and you're not too fond of the you know, the score you got, take it again, okay? And I'll give you, I'll look for it and I'll look for it. Give you the higher of the two scores, right? I just want to make sure you pass the actual exam. And the way to pass the actual exam is to take lots and lots of practice exams. All right, so I'll see you in five minutes. Uh, use that time to get logged into Pass Perfect and set up mastery test number one. Okay, I'll see you in a few.